yeah, so on the, the bottom here of this example, instead of kilojoules per mole, uh, these should be joules per mole per Kelvin. The numbers are fine. We'll leave them at um, 90 and 90 for both of them. So what we're going to do now is sort of design, not really the code, but just look at the equations that we have to solve and build up all those little intermediate equations along the way. Um, and the general form of the energy balance that I had given yesterday um, was this one. Can I fit that all on one page? Yeah, I can fit that on one page. So we had two differentials that we wanted to solve. One of them was with respect to temperature. Um, and so dt dt was equal to q dot. And I'm going to use the shorter of the two here instead of the longer of the two. Minus delta H, so enthalpy of reaction, times rate of A divided by stoichiometric coefficient of A, which, by the way, that's almost always negative 1. Um, but in case a problem comes up where that is not the case, there you go, times volume, um, divided by the sum of the moles of I times the heat capacity of each species I. That was our energy balance. Uh, the material balance, it's kind of variable, right? We could do DNI with respect to time. We could do concentration with respect to time. If it's a single reaction, we typically write this stuff in terms of conversion with respect to time. Um, and so that expression would look like the conversion of A with respect to time is equal to minus R sub A over, there's a couple of different things there. You could do CA0. Eh, we might as well just do CA0. That's a convenient one. Uh, if you wanted to, you could do instead of R, minus RA over CA0, you could do minus RA over NA0 times volume. Right? There's many different, well, not many. There's two or three different ways that you could write something like that. And so our goal is to figure out how do we take all that information from over there and go over here. The very first thing that you should look for is what's your initial condition. So with both of these, if I look at an initial condition for temperature, somewhere it says the initial temperature is something, um, which happens to be 300 Kelvin. Uh, so this, I think actually green will show up. Here's my initial temperature. Um, and so what that means is my initial condition for temperature is T of time zero is going to be equal to 300 Kelvin. The initial condition for conversion is almost always zero. Um, there is no, it, that does not need to be stated. Um, and that's not really that much of an assumption. Before the thing starts reacting, we have not converted any of the thing, um, kind of by definition. So that's the very first thing that you should look for. The other thing you generally look for if you're going to put this into MATLAB, look at how long I need to calculate this. Did I give you a size of a reactor? Did I give you a time of a reactor? This one, I just generally state plot the two. So we can kind of plot it over any time scale that we want. Um, so when it finally comes time to plot that, we'll just pick some time um, and plot it for various times and see what happens uh, for the reactor. So now we have to figure out how do we get all of the terms over here on the right um, and see if any of them are initially given over on the left. I think only one of them is actually given in the problem statement. Um, do you remember this term, adiabatic, Q0? Q being equal to 0 is wonderful. On Friday, we'll see what happens when Q is not 0. It's not really that bad. It just adds an additional term to the top uh, that's dependent on temperature, but it's, it's pretty small. So even a non-adiabatic system is not awful. Um, but we do get, because this is adiabatic, we can take that Q uh, and turn it to 0. Other than that, there's not a lot left that we can do. We do have some um, CA0 values. So we know CA0 is equal to 2 moles per liter. Um, and so that means this particular value is 2 moles per liter. But other than that, um, 
oh, we know volume. So here we've got one liter up here. So we know this is one liter. We know volume is constant because it's liquid phase, so we immediately assume that, that volume is constant for any kind of a liquid phase composition. Other than that, none of the numbers over here directly show up over here, right? There's a heat, some heat capacity terms at the bottom that will eventually show up, but on their own, they don't, it's not like heat capacity by itself shows up over there anywhere. So we're going to start working through how do we get every one of these. Um, I'm going to start with the material balance, the dxa dt is equal to minus ra over ca naught, because that's where we've been before. That, that part of this has not changed from weeks one and two and early, yeah, just weeks one and two. Um, so we'll tackle the material balance first. The only thing that we need to figure out there for the material balance is r sub a. Um, and we know that the reaction is elementary. Right, so according to our problem statement, it's elementary, so we can write a rate law for that. Um, and I'm going to flip over onto the next page to do that. Since this is A reversible with B, um, we're going to have to figure out uh, what the rate law is with the reversible term involved. How do I know whether to write the reaction in terms of partial pressure or concentration? There's two things that give it away on this particular problem. One, we are told that this is liquid phase. Right? As soon as you see liquid phase, we don't do partial pressures for liquids, we do them for gases. Um, and so your uh, rate laws are going to be written in terms of concentration here and not partial pressure. There's one other hint at it. What's the other hint that you're probably going to use C's and not P's? There's no pressure given, but a KC is also given. Right? So down here on the bottom, the one equilibrium K that I gave you happens to be KC. And that's the one that you use with concentrations. So there's two. One is pretty strong, right? It's a liquid. You can't do partial pressure. The other is a hint down there that KC has those particular units. That's that's that's. Is that like an alarm or is that a phone call? Wow, that's. Uh, I would I would lose it if that was my ringtone every single time. That's stressful. So minus RA, if this thing is reversible, uh, remember, I'm going to try to keep the difference between the Ks as clear as I can. So lowercase Ks don't have those caps on them, and uppercase Ks are going to have the caps. Uh, it's the sum of the product, or sorry, the product of all the concentrations of the react, uh, yes, reactants raised to their stoichiometric coefficients, which is a very long way of saying CA um, for the first one, minus the same thing for the products divided by the relevant equilibrium constant, so over Kc. So great, I have replaced a single variable that I didn't know, which was Ra, with one, two, three, four more, uh, three more, right? I don't know little k, ca, cb, or kc, so I'm going to have to come up with expressions for those, all of which, at the end of the day, have to be some function of only time x and temperature, and any number of constants along the way, right? Anything that's not time conversion or temperature has to be a constant. So we're just going to start tackling various forms of those until we get them all into a form that we can use. Um, I'll just start from left to right. So we know that the k, lowercase k, was given as 0 0.01 inverse seconds. And it was given this at 350K. Uh, that's a temperature K on the right. And then we were also told that the activation energy EA was 30 kilojoules per mole. So between those two, I could just take that 0.01 and plug it in if the entire reaction always occurred at exactly 350 Kelvin. It doesn't. We know it doesn't even start at that temperature. So we have to use some expression to adjust k, rate constant k, this lowercase k, for any other temperature. Um, and so we can use our um, Arrhenius expression. At this point, you, you have to make um, 
kind of a couple of choices of some arbitrary subscripts, right? Something's got to have a subscript because we're going to be using k's a lot. What I mean is this. If we want to know the k at any temperature, we take that k, we take the old k, sorry, and multiply it by the exponential of the activation energy over RT times 1 minus T over T. We, right, T over T, what's T over T? We gotta pick some subscripts here so that things make sense. Um, normally the way that this is done or that you will see it done most often um, is all of these terms here get the subscript ref. Or you'll occasionally see that as just an uppercase R. Try to stay away from zero, uh, but I mean, it, it's not the end of the world. As long as you know what your subscript means, that's okay. It's not gonna be wrong if you do something else. Um, but generally those are considered the reference ones. The challenge with that is you can have multiple references within the same problem and they will all be slightly different. So I'm gonna go ahead and call this one um, ref but I'm gonna write this one in green um, because it's for a rate constant. So this is the form that we would need down here from the Arrhenius expression, but we have to use all the subscripts correctly. And so the subscripts come in and look like this. K at any function T will be equal to the previous K that we already had, so that's K ref, times the exponential of EA over RT, this one gets a ref. Oops, not closed yet, open. One minus T over T. And so the one on the top here is also T ref. And so I use that in green specifically for the, the act, or sorry, the um, rate constant K. We're gonna have another ref for the other one and I'll try to pick another color. I'll do yellow for that one. So good, we've got K. Um, I'm gonna come back to this one a few times. So we, we're trying to figure out R sub A, right? That's ideally the one that we're getting. Um, we have now determined lowercase k. Uh, we'll just move from left to right. So the next one up is concentration of A. If I wanna know the concentration of A, I have to go back to that giant form. Those were the lights, right? Not me. Uh, I have to go back to that giant form of CA if I have a gas phase reaction. This is a liquid phase reaction, so it's not so bad because this one basically looks like the numerator in that term, which is CA is equal to, or C of anything is CA zero times theta minus the stoichiometric coefficients and all that kind of stuff. So the C sub A that we've got here, I'm just gonna write them both because it's um, pretty simple to do. C sub A is one minus, or sorry, CA naught times one minus XA. And C sub B will be CA zero times one plus XA. So often this one is not necessarily one, right? I think we have seen other times where this looks more like um, CA zero times X sub A, and maybe there's a stoichiometric coefficient in there. Where, where'd the one come from? Why is it one plus XA and not just XA? Because they started at the same, right? Not only is it a reversible reaction, but if you look back on the product or the problem statement, I said we start off with the same amount of both of them, um, which is why the, the one shows up right there. If it's not liquid phase, then these are the expressions that can tend to get pretty massive. Um, they're not too bad if it's gas phase and constant volume. Those are okay. They look more or less like what this does. If they're gas phase and not constant volume, that's when you have the big long one on the top and the even bigger one underneath um, for C sub A. But nevertheless, the approach is the same, right? I got a K first, now I got my CAs. If I flip back to that equation over here, that's fine, I now know CA here and I know CB here. And I have to figure out the other KC, which is our equilibrium K. So in order to get that one, we're in actually a pretty similar situation as what we've got here, except I've given you a KC 
right? I've given you KC was equal to what, two? Yeah, two. Um, and that was at 325K. Which again, that would be fine if it was an isothermal reactor exactly at 325K, just stick that number in there and that's all that we need. Because it's a non-isothermal reactor, we have to adjust that for temperature. Um, and the adjustment there for temperature, uh, the general form, I'm gonna make this deliberately look like the other one that I just wrote a minute ago, just so that you can see they are quite similar, but I need to pull it up. Um, that form there, the third one down with the exponent. If I want to take K and figure out what it is at some temperature, I need K at some other temperature times the exponential of delta H over RT times 1 minus T over T. So in order to do that, though, we have to have, again, another kind of like a reference state, right? So these are already KCs because that's the one that I'm working with. But one of those is the old KC and one of those is the new KC. How do you denote which one is old, which one is new? You can literally use the subscripts old and new if you want. I don't mind. The standard that you will typically see is, again, these conditions here are the ref conditions or they're subscripted as R. But they don't need to be the same as the reference conditions for the rate constant, K, which is why I put them in a different color here. It's also why I deliberately chose a different temperature. Um, so they can be different. The pattern looks pretty much the same, right? So this is KC ref. You can use superscripts too. You won't hurt anything if you use superscripts. T ref and T ref. So the general pattern there looks pretty much the same. We're scaling an equilibrium constant in approximately the same way as we're scaling a rate constant. Uh, that's not an accident either. It, you can go through and show that the, the two are quite similar. Um, we're not going to do that. What's the assumption of this expression? Delta H is constant. We have to check that assumption, or if, that, if we didn't check that assumption, maybe we would just check it before we started. The general form for delta H, if we want to adjust delta H for any temperature, is that delta H is equal to delta H, and I'm deliberately leaving some space there, plus delta Cp times, I think it was T minus T ref, yeah, T minus T something. All right, that was the general form, and yet again, we can have a different delta H at one temperature, and we typically call that ref. Right, so we can have three completely different reference temperatures for three different um, materials, and you'll just have to keep track of which temperature goes where. So in this particular case, the delta H ref that we have um, was given in the problem statement as minus 40 kilojoules per mole. And the T ref that we were given is 300 K. So if we have that delta H and we need to adjust it for temperature, that's the way that we would go about doing it. Fortunately, though, we've got a delta Cp term there. If we work out the delta Cp, and since I don't think we've actually worked out a delta Cp yet, let's just write the whole thing out. Um, delta Cp is defined as the sum of the stoichiometric coefficients of I times the heat capacities of I. Actually, I think it's... No, that's fine. We're going to use that. Um, so the stoichiometric coefficient of A is minus 1. The heat capacity of A is 90. Stoichiometric coefficient of B is, yes, minus 1, plus 1. And the heat capacity of B is 90. So ever so conveniently, this works out to be 0. Convenient, right? I wrote a problem that I can solve. So as it turns out then, that this delta H, even though we do have a reference condition and we do have um, a reference H, it's always constant. 
that's going to happen a fair amount of time. Yeah. How do you find the delta CP if you're only given A's, B's, and C's? You won't be given A's, B's, and C's. If you do, then you have to integrate it. Um, that's where the enthalpy, actually, you can still do it with those. You just have to evaluate the heat capacity at a certain temperature, right? And use that temperature for everything and then calculate the delta CPs. So the question was if I was given C sub P is equal to A plus BT plus CT squared plus, don't crash on me, DT cubed. How do I get a delta CP from something like that? Usually what we end up doing is evaluate CP at the initial temperature and assume that that's constant. If you don't do that, then you have to include that fourth order form inside all of your integrals, all of your differentials, and it becomes a, a real nightmare to do something like that. So this is normally the approach that you would take. Evaluate the heat capacity at some temperature of the system, usually the initial, and assume that it's constant. If you find out, oh, I started at 300 Kelvin and I went to 1,000 Kelvin, which is nowhere near 300, pick a temperature in between and then recalculate the problem and see if the agreement is you know, normal, if it hasn't changed very much from something like that. Well, the A's, B's, C's, and T's aren't function of, of temperature. They're constant. Yeah, the CP, calculate the CP in that 3.5. Yes, correct. The, whatever temperature you choose is, uh, the best one is usually either the inlet or the um, initial, but that choice can vary depending on what your application is. So let's see, our delta CP is good. We actually made a fair amount of progress there on the thermo side, or not on the thermo, the energy balance side. All of this was just to get the material balance to work, right? At this point, everything is either a function of temperature, conversion, or time. In this case, there is no time that explicitly appears. Unless I missed anything, does anybody, it's possible I missed something, but I think I covered them all for the material balance. Because if we go back here, we now have a form for Kc as a function of either time, conversion, or temperature, or both, all three, could be all three. Cool, so that is this one. We now have a form for Ra over Ca0. We know everything there. That's now a function of everything that we need. And so we need to tackle the ones up top. We just solved for delta H. So that one's not going to be a problem. We know what that is. It's constant. Along the way, we also solved for RA. Uh, not like solved for, but we you know, developed an expression for it as a function of just the variables that we're interested in. So we're good with RA. We're good with the stoichiometric coefficient of A. We're good with V. The only ones left are these terms down here on the bottom, the sum of Ni, Cpi. Um, and we saw a slight modification of that form um, on, what, Monday's class? Uh, actually, I guess I'll just leave that and write underneath it. We saw that you can replace, if you have just a single uh, reaction and you have the expression moles of I, Cpi, summed over all species I, which I was reminded again why sometimes, well, never mind. I'll bring it up when we get to it next week. No, I can't. At the beginning of your book, your book says all species are known as I, and then you get to multiple reactions that were in next week, and they say, okay, now all species are J and reactions are I. It's like, why didn't you just put J as reactions? But they did. These are the things that bother me. So we saw that this is equal to the Na0 times the sum of theta i times Cpi minus delta Cp over the stoichiometric coefficient of A times the conversion of A. What do my brackets look like there? Square? So, okay, not terrible. Um, we have some terms. You know, this is the one that we're after, is NICPI. 
We already know all of the heat capacities. Those were given to us. We happen to know that the heat capacity, uh, sorry, the delta heat capacity is zero. So this term goes away. We found that in the previous step. It, it can be very tempting in the energy balance when you first recognize that delta Cp is zero, you can be very tempted to just knock out the whole energy balance because somehow the denominator is zero. Um, usually that comes from somehow equating this sum of theta i Cpi as something to do with delta Cpi. It's not. That term's always there. Um, so it, it, it's a source of confusion. It's come up a few times where a student will come to me and say, well, delta Cp was zero. How can we solve for the energy balance because the denominator is zero? There's always going to be that non-zero term of Na0 times the sum of theta i Cpi. That's always there because there's always physically stuff in your system. So if, if that was more confusing than anything, don't worry about it. You were probably good before I started talking. Uh, yeah. Sorry? Uh, what's the CPI times uh, uh, That is one way. The, the easier way to interpret that is not theta i times CPI. It's Na0 times theta i times CPI. Because what this represents is the moles of any species i times its heat capacity i that were initially present. So that it's a little easier if you put the n inside there, because then it has a little bit of physical significance. This term here is saying, how does that product of Ni times Cpi change as the reaction proceeds? In our particular case, it won't change at all, because the heat capacities of the two components are equal. And so there is no change as the um, reaction proceeds. Delta Ni times Cp. I would hesitate to write it that way. So we know that. Um, the theta i's we haven't had to calculate yet, but each of these are going to look something like Ca0 over Ca0, which is 1. Actually, no, we already did calculate those, right? We used those in the material balance. We didn't explicitly write them, but these are our thetas. So, OK, we already know those. I saved a step. So I don't need to write those again. Those are both going to be equal to 1. Um, and the only thing left here is Na0. Uh, and that one's usually going to come from, at least for liquid phases, it's usually going to look like Na0 over V is equal to Ca0. We happen to know what Ca0 is, so we can always write that as uh, Na0 is Ca0 times V. So good, now we know this one as well. And now we've got all of the elements that we need in order to solve the problem. Um, everything that we have written is a function of only either time, conversion, or temperature. So if you see, for example, a question on an exam that says derive an expression for such and such in terms of at most the variables time, conversion, and temperature, this is what we're talking about, right? It's a bunch of constants, the only things that are changing our conversion, temperature, and potentially time. Although time is never, time's time. It's, it's the independent, independent variable, so that will probably never show up. How could you potentially have something that varies in time? You could have, let's say it's an adiabatic reactor, right? So there's no energy going in or out of the time, and, or in or out of the reactor, and then after two hours of operation, somebody comes along and kicks the reactor and knocks the insulation off, and it turns into a non-isothermal reactor with heat exchange. Then time could show up somewhere because Q would now be a function of time. Um, we kind of have to try hard to get time in there. It's not going to show up most of the time. Get it? <laughs> Nothing wrong with puns, folks. They're harmless. I don't know. Was that a pun? might not have been a pun. OK, so we know the bottom part here. That's generally about as far as I will take this stuff by hand. You could do some calculations along the way and start substituting numbers for symbols. So for example, I could have the number 2 down here instead of CA0. I, as I had mentioned earlier the first time that we coded in MATLAB, I generally suggest that you do not do that. 
It's much easier to troubleshoot these equations if you see them in the symbolic form. It'll also get you more comfortable with writing them in symbolic form because you're gonna do it both on paper and then in MATLAB. So try to leave them in that symbolic form as long as you can because it's easier to troubleshoot things when it's not numbers, when it's actually symbols. So any questions on any of that? We've got about enough time to look at the template. The template's a weird one. Um, so we're, it's not that weird. It looks very similar to the uh, single variable version, um, but it's different enough that I want to point out the differences and then we will code it. We'll have to code it tomorrow because we're getting up on time here, right? It's, we've got another eight minutes. Uh, so let me pull that up. Are there any questions on that before I switch to the template? This is a pretty standard kind of approach to these types of problems. So for example, almost all of them on your homework for this week um, are going to look essentially like this. I've given you various elements along the way. You can tackle all of those problems if you do exactly the format that we've done here. Start with the differential equations and then start finding equations for everything else that you need um, along the way. So let me switch over and we'll pull up the template. I was on, my, on a vacation once and I changed my alarm ringtone to something unique so that terrible buzzing reminded me of this. And now I have, I can't, it was a song and now I can't listen to that song anymore because every time I hear that song I think that was when I had to wake up at like two in the morning to get to the airport. Um, there's a name for that. It's like the guy rang the bell for the dog and the dog associated it with the food. Pavlovian response, yes, that's what that is. Why does everybody laugh at my password when they see my password? Uh, it's called security, folks. <laughs> How do I remember that password? It's a passphrase. It's not a password. I, I heard the, the recognition. Oh. Okay, so under tools and resources, MATLAB resources, um, solving ODEs in MATLAB. Solving a single ODE, you've already done that. You'll have to continue solving a handful of single ODEs, but really the vast majority of ODEs that we solve from here out in the class are going to be coupled ODEs. The reason for that is because most things either vary with temperature or they have multiple reactions in them. Um, when we introduce the new reactors in the second half of the class, you'll have a couple more single ODEs that you'll have to solve. Generally, a single ODE, though, can be solved by hand in a lot of cases for, for problems like this which is why we tend to focus more on the coupled ODEs. So what do I mean by a coupled ODE? A coupled ODE looks like this, where I have the same independent variable. I'm gonna unhook myself. Oh wow, it's been recording the whole time. Okay, stop recording.